Welcome to Triangle Grace Church. It is so good to see you all this day and glad that we can be together as a body of Christ, those online, those that are here in the sanctuary. What a joy we have to worship our Lord together. Let us enjoy him this day. I would like to invite you, if you're able, let us stand together for our call to worship. You will see that in your bulletin. It comes from Isaiah 53. Strengthen your feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. Only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. Morning, Triangle Grace. It's a beautiful morning, um, and it is a true joy for us to be able to come and worship. Um, so let's sing, You Are Good, to our Lord, joyfully. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation. Here we go. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship. You are good all the time. 
Sing past me now. Pass me now. Here we go. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior.
If you are visiting with us at Triangle Grace Church today, we would like to welcome you here. We are glad that you're visiting with us. You can find in the in the pews a uh, new to TGC card. So if you would fill that out, you can put it in the plate in the back of the church. We would love to get to know you better and have a chance to introduce Triangle Grace to you in a little bit different way. Also, we want to invite everyone for a time of fellowship after we worship here. We will go into the fellowship hall and actually use the fellowship hall for fellowship. Um, so we'll have snacks there and a time to visit and to say hello to each other. And uh, we've been having cookouts uh, through Triangle Grace this summer. So we want to thank those of you who've hosted a cookout. And we look forward to um, going to other people's houses and enjoying some food at your house. You can uh, learn more about uh, the cookouts on our website. Let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for who you are. Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of the church where we may gather this day with confidence going boldly to the throne of grace. Lord, we remember this day that you came to save the world, not to condemn the world. Lord, we thank you that you yourself came to earth and walked among us. You went to the cross, and the cross could not hold you down. We have victory through your resurrection, Lord. So we celebrate your goodness this day. Lord, as we gather together this day, we affirm our faith in you. As we pray, Lord, we remember the Apostles' Creed. So, Lord, we together say what we believe. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that we can affirm our belief in you and know with assurance that you hear our prayers, that you are with us, that you love us. But Lord, we come humbly before you. We know that we are sinful, that we do not put you first in our lives, Lord. We confess, Lord, that we often put our own agenda first. We thank you, Lord, that you invite us to come humbly so that we can confess our need of you, our Savior. So, Lord, hear us as we pray silently to you, confessing our sins. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this important moment that we can confess to you. We affirm what your scripture says, that we will confess with our lips that you are Lord and believe in our hearts that you have, raised, have been raised from the dead, that we will be saved. For your scripture tells us, Lord, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we do have in you. We thank you for the gift of prayer, for the gift of the church, for the assurance that we are indeed pardoned of our sins. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you this day and worship you. It is with joy that we give you thanks, and we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. We do have peace with God. We do have forgiveness through Christ Jesus. Let us turn to our brothers and sisters in Christ and share the peace of Christ with each other.
it is a joy to have what we call the life of the church, a time that we can share with one another what's going on in the body of Christ through Triangle Grace and through our community. So it's my joy today to have uh, Cindy and Jenny here this morning and to share a little bit about the ministry that you've been involved in. So I would like to ask you, what is Emmanuel Iglesia? Well, Emmanuel Iglesia is actually Emmanuel Presbyteriana Iglesia Church, uh, in, which is a Hispanic Latinx church in North Durham. Emmanuel Iglesia is the food pantry we're here to talk about and the, the, pan, the, the ministry we've been involved in now for several years. I'm not actually sure how many. Um, so in 2010, in response to increasing food insecurity in our community, Emmanuel Iglesia started a free food pantry. And so 12 years later, <laughs> it's really a pretty amazing story because they started with 50 to 60 families that they served weekly. Uh, in 2020, in the spring of 2020, 10 um, years later, they were serving what we thought was an amazing 350 families a week. And now, they're currently averaging 650 families. So it's really pretty amazing. So I have some numbers, so I have to look at them. <laughs> um, this is equivalent to about 3,000 people or 12,000 meals a week. And since April of 2020, they've served 1,344,000 meals to 336,000 individuals. And that is pretty amazing because this, this is a 100% volunteer organization. And we're just a small part of it. So it is quite impressive when you think back at 12 years they've been doing this. So TGC is just one of several churches that helps provide shelf-stable products. Um, and the, they also use several people like the food pantry, interface faith uh, food, uh, shuttle, um, grocery stores, but many churches are involved in this in this as well. So Thank I think you. that's uh, the story of Iglesias Food Pantry to the best of my knowledge. That's great. How did you all get involved in this type of work with Emmanuel Iglesias? Well, TGC put out a call for just someone to deliver food, and I thought, well, I can do that. And here I am still now several years later doing it because they're, they're just such a wonderful group, and they're very inspirational. When you go talk to them, they're so kind, uh, so positive, that it's really, you look forward to going back. So that's how I got involved. Great, and I wanna ask Jenny, can you tell us a little bit, Jenny, about the shape of TG's um, involvement with this? Yeah, um, Triangle Grace is involved in a number of ways. One, we collect donations of food, um, many of you have probably seen there's a cart in the narthex where you can leave food. No glass jars, though. <laughs> um, and we also collect donations, uh, cash donations. So if anyone wants to contribute that way, um, you can designate it to go to the, uh, the food pantry. In addition, we have people who shop for food each week and people who deliver food each week. How has your faith in Jesus motivated you to be involved in this ministry? Well, it's just one uh, another way to show Jesus' love for us to other people and to love our neighbors. Great. That's great. And Cindy, how did you see God at work in this ministry? Well, just realizing the magnitude that I just spoke of of this outreach and its success over a dozen years is really evidence of God's work. Um, but I wanted to share with you a message. Uh, there are, are a couple who basically manage the food, pa food pantry, and some of you probably met them, Margaret and McGill. Uh, McGill um, wrote this to me, and I wanted to quote him because I thought it was so wonderful because we had talked with him about maybe coming to speak to the congregation, but we kind of got called upon to do this uh, last minute and uh, that we were not able to work that out, but... He says, we would have loved the opportunity to tell you all how much your partnership with the food pantry has meant to both of us personally and most importantly to so many families. What a satisfaction for all of us to know that when we are in front of our maker, we are going to be asked to join the sheep. 
please, re please reiterate to them how much they are loved at Iglesia Emmanuel and how much we all appreciate and depend on their help. Great, thank you. And it's important for us to know, I'm sure, are there, is this something that we all can be involved in? Definitely, we, we need people to donate food and donate money. Um, we need people to shop. We, we have volunteers who shop and um, either bring the food here or take it directly to the food pantry in North Durham. Um, we also need people, like I say, to deliver the food. Uh, some people don't shop, but they just deliver the food. Um, and I know that the food pantry also needs people to help uh, sort and pack the food Monday through Wednesday and to help distribute the food. On, they distribute it every Wednesday. Um, so there's a separate sign up for people to help with those things as well. Great. So thank you all for sharing this story with us. And if you would like f further information, a way you can get involved, please see Cindy and Jenny. Let me pray for you all and for uh, this church, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your ministry here in this community. We ask your blessing on Emmanuel Iglesia. We thank you, Lord, for them and their ministry um, to spread your good news, but also their ministry to, to share food with people who need food in our community. Lord, we ask that you be with all of those families and with Emmanuel Iglesia. We thank you that Triangle can be a part of your ministry in this way. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. At this time, it gives us great joy to welcome the children forward for the children's sermon. Hey, everybody. Good to see you today. My goodness, almost August, isn't it? Well, uh, which means school's starting soon. Uh-oh. Anyway, um, so... So I was wondering, uh, who? Uh, I know you watch a lot of movies. You watch a lot of cartoons. Who's your favorite, like, bad guy? Because every every cartoon has like a bad guy. Uh, you know, the arch enemy. Can you think of any from any show that you 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 like? Think? Oh yeah. When I think of a bad guy, here's a bad guy. Oh, I I can I, I can think of a few like. Uh, Darth Vader. <laughs> you know, if you ever watch Star Wars, it's like, oh my goodness, there's like the epitome of the bad guy. Or, oh gosh, how about Zerg? Remember Zerg? From, what's that? What's Zerg from? Uh, Toy Story. Thank you. Yeah, Toy Story. You know, Buzz Lightyear. He's trying to. But I, I think. Well, how, how about Scooby Doo? It's, it's always like Old Man Withers, right? He's kind of. It, he's the ghost. They pull it off and. Yeah, who, who do you think of a bad, when you think of bad guy cartoon dudes? Well, in Buzz Lightyear, yeah. there's like another Buzz Lightyear. Oh, yeah, the dark Buzz Lightyear, yes. Yeah, I remember him. He, he wasn't a good, for me, I think growing up, I think the epitome of the bad guy for me was the Wicked Witch of the, is it West? West, West yes. Wick, <laughs> you know, those flying monkeys, it's like, ah! So, gosh, you know, and, and every one of those shows, you got all these, you know, this bad person, and you just hope, you know, in the end, you kind of hope that he, he or she gets their own, right? When, you know, when they pull the mask off of Old Man Withers, it's like everyone, Old Man Withers, and he gets arrested and taken away, and if it wasn't up for you kids, I would have, anyway. Um, or Darth Vader, you, you know, kind of hope, you know, that, that, that really dark guy just gets, you know, in the end. But sometimes, some of the stories, something even better happens, right? Sometimes, rather than the bad guy getting in trouble or going to jail or being put to death or something, sometimes the bad guy just changes. And, and, and he becomes an entirely different person at the end of the movie. Do, do you remember one like that? Oh yeah, the Frost in the you know that great movie of the Frost, Jack Frost, I think it was called, right? And he changed at the end, and it was like amazing. Because, um, the girl hugged him and then he felt you know, when those hugs and love come, you know that that is exactly what often changes the bad guy, right? 
Well, uh, we're, we're actually going to uh, look at a story in big church as we continue on. Some of you will be in here, some may leave, but uh, you know, it's a story of a guy named Saul who was being really mean to people who love Jesus. Uh, he was going around uh, even wanting to have them put in jail and, and even killed. And, and he wasn't a, a nice guy. Now, all of the bad guys in every movie are complicated. Uh, I mean, if, if you know Wicked, the story, you know, you all know, now you know all about the Wicked Witch of the West and her backstory. But, but yeah, they're all complicated, and there's reasons maybe why they're bad. Uh, and and Paul, Saul had his reasons, too. But you know what? Jesus came to him, and, and like you kind of said, kind of told him, hey, I'm, I'm real, and I, I love you. And, and his whole life, this guy who was hurting people, his whole life was changed. And amazing things happened because of what happened to Saul. One person, when, when their heart is changed, can then begin to change the world. And well, you know, I, I, I hope when you see bad guys in movies, don't, don't root for them to lose, root for them for their hearts to be changed. And, and maybe, you know, you can help change the hearts of some naughty friends of yours. That you, you're kind of like your arch enemy. Why don't I change their heart? And today we're going to hear a little bit more about Saul and how Jesus changed his heart. So maybe you'll talk about that in, in children's church. Maybe you'll hear about it here. Or maybe when you go home with your moms and dads, you can read about it at home together. But let me pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who does change hearts. Uh, even the very worst person can be changed. The chief of all sinners can be changed. We thank you that when we meet you, we indeed are changed for the better. We pray that you'd bless these kids as they continue to think about you and learn about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for listening, and we'll catch up a little bit later, okay?
you were with us last week, uh, I uh, did a children's sermon uh, using my puppet, Kermit the Frog, and I have to tell you, I don't think I've had as many positive comments about any sermon I've ever preached in my entire life. So I was considering just kind of, you know, from this point on, just having Kermit up here and see where it would take us over the next few weeks, but... Uh, so, the Granadas, you all are leaving, aren't you? We, are, Nicolette, Mark, we are going to greatly, greatly miss you. Thank you for the ways in which you have poured into the life of our church. Why don't you stand up for a minute, and we just want to <laughs> applaud and <laughs> bless you. moving down to the Charlotte area to be closer to their family, and uh, this is your home away from home, and whenever you're ready to repent and return, <laughs> we will take you back, we promise. Well, as I said, uh, today we, we are looking at an amazing moment of transformation in a single man's uh, life, which then has this uh, just tremendous transformational, tr transformational effect upon the world for the next 2,000 years. Uh, it, it, you know, and our world right now needs more transformation, doesn't it? You know it, I know it, and if there's one lesson that might come out of this, uh, this message, one of many, really, that transformation happens one heart at a time one person at a time. It's not through political movements. It's not through protesting and marching. It's through changing the heart. Changing the heart of people. And there's no one that changes the heart of a person more than Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to look at today. And I, it, it, we, we, we've been working our way through the book of Acts uh, written by Luke. Uh, and we're fast forwarding from chapter 4 all the way up to chapter 9. There's so many good things. It's so uh, deflating for us not to be able to look at chapters 5, 6, and 7, 8. But we are on a trajectory to get to Ephesians by, uh, by the fall. And so we're uh, reaching now chapter 9 as we consider the transformation that happens in the life of Saul as he met Christ on the road to Damascus. And and frankly, this passage frustrates me because Luke does so many wonderful things all at once as he writes this, and I don't even know where to start to explain it all and to give it justice in the amount of time that we have. There's so many vantage points that you can look at this passage and consider it from. You know, uh, Luke, who writes... This story about Paul, uh, Saul, uh, who is also called Paul, they happen to be really good friends. Uh, Luke loves Saul. They lived their lives out. They traveled together for years. They, they ended up in Rome together, and, and Luke probably watched Saul's execution at the hands of the Romans. And and, you know, imagine having the privilege to write about the life of one of your best friends. To tell the world about, oh, here, here's what he did. Here's the impact he had. Uh, he had this deep love and respect and he even suffered with him. And he wanted to get the story out about what happened to his friend to honor him and everything he wrote. Or we could look at this passage from a historical perspective. You know, if you remember, remember Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote the books of, book of Acts. And at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, he says that many have undertaken to draw up an account of things which were filled among us. I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, and I too decide to write an orderly account for you. He did his research. He found out what happened. He, he, he wrote it up for posterity's sake so that history would know what happened, Sir William Ramsey, one of the 
greatest archaeologists who ever lived, says of Luke that he's a first-rank historian. The historical implications of this encounter were, were huge. And, and so we, we, could, we could read these verses understanding not only Luke's love for Paul, but his sense as a historian to convey truth, what actually happened through these transformative days. Or uh, Luke wasn't just a, a friend, and, and he wasn't just a historian, he was also a theologian. And as a theologian, he was acutely interested in demonstrating a deep understanding of who the person of God is, who the person of Christ is, who the person of the Holy Spirit is, and particularly how God's plan was was unfolding through these events and throughout history. And he particularly had an interest, a biblical theology interest in the book of Isaiah uh, and, and, and the lens that Isaiah from the Old Testament had. Uh, and, it, and Isaiah's uh, proclamation, prophetic proclamation, speaks directly in to this passage you can't understand it unless you understand what's going on in Isaiah. He's not just a friend. He's not just a historian. He's not just a theologian, but he's also an evangelist. He, he doesn't tell this story just to tell the story. He's telling the story to convince us that it is so, that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that, that we should recognize him as as a Lord and Savior of our lives, as just as Saul does in this story. And again, at the beginning of the gospel, he says, I've written this as an orderly account so that you may be certain of the things you've been taught. This chapter 9 comes at, uh, from all of these horizons as Luke writes about Paul, and honestly, I don't even know where to start. And so let me read it, and I'd ask you to pray. Here's what Luke writes. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus and so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you, what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for Three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, uh, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas. Uh, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has, uh, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is cho an, a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, 
the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray, Lord. We uh, ask that if there are any scales on our eyes or upon our hearts this day, that you would remove them. Help us to understand who you are and help us to be transformed by the very presence of you, our living Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First, it probably would be helpful to just talk about who Saul is uh, a little bit, a little bit of background. Uh, as you read here, he was born in Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus was a uh, small town in southwest Turkey. Uh, he was a Jew. Uh, he was also a Roman citizen, uh, which was important. It comes into play later in the book of Acts. Uh, but, but he moved to Jerusalem. He, he uh, ended up studying under uh, a man named Gamaliel. He, he was one of the leading Jewish scholars uh, and rabbis, teachers in, in Jerusalem and well respected by everyone. We find out uh, much about Saul. And, and well, of course, he, his, as I said, his name is also Paul. Uh, you probably know him more as Paul than you do as Saul. Uh, He's named Paul. It wasn't because of his conversion. You know, Abraham, when he, when he met the Lord, his name was changed to Abraham. Uh, but that's not the case with, with Saul to Paul. It's not because of his conversion that his name was changed. It's just simply that, that Paul was like the Greek version, Latin version of the, the name Saul. And so Paul... Uh, Saul, as he began to minister to those who were not Jewish, uh, the Gentiles, that's the biblical word for people who weren't Jewish, the Gentiles, uh, that, that really was his calling to, to reach people who weren't Jewish. And so he used that name Paul, uh, which he probably had as a kid growing up. Uh, so, so anyway, same person, Paul, Saul. We find out a lot about his character from what he writes to some of the other churches, uh, to the churches that he visited, and then, then he would write letters to them. He, uh, we find out uh, from, uh, from Galatia, uh, as he writes to the Galatians, that, um, uh, that, that he was a part of the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees, if you, you've heard of them, they were one of the uh, Jewish sects, one of the the, the leading political, religious, theological groups who, who kind of controlled temple life and social life and spiritual life. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the two, two big groups. And the Pharisees in particular were particularly zealous. Uh, so he describes himself, uh, you know, I, was, I was zealous. He, he says that I was a, uh, uh, basically he says, I, I'm a young buck growing up. I, I I was outpacing all of my peers, advancing beyond those of other ages, uh, of those of my own age, I mean. Uh, as he writes to the Philippians, he says that I was a Hebrew of Hebrews in regarding to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law. I was blameless, faultless. He, he did everything right. You couldn't get a better Jew 
than Paul in his own opinion. Well, as we uh, turn to this passage, uh, how are we introduced to him? We were introduced to him that he was openly hostile uh, towards Christians. In fact, it says that he was threatening them. He, he wanted to murder them. And when we, uh, it says that he wanted to, uh, he had murderous threats towards the Lord's disciples. The Lord's disciples. Of course, when we hear the Lord, uh, we're talking about Jesus here. And, and they were his disciples. And it wasn't just that you know, they followed his teaching. They liked Jesus. They followed his teaching. He was a good guy. Uh, we want to learn from what he taught. That, that's not what they meant when they called him the Lord. And in fact, in, in the book of Acts, Jesus is called Lord over a hundred times. Over and over. Lord, Lord, Lord. And it wasn't just because he was a good teacher. It's because they believed that this Jesus died was buried and was raised to life, that they actually met him, saw him. They saw him ascend into heaven. They believed this man was still alive. And they confessed, this has got to be the Messiah. We are giving our life to this man. And, and there's nothing that made Paul more angry than this kind of thinking. Uh, th this man who knew the Jewish law and the Jewish expectations. Uh, he, he, he says, uh, he's talking in Acts 26. Paul is talking before King Agrippa, telling him his story. And, and he says to him, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was once convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, he was saying, look, I thought these Christians were crazy too. I, that they were dangerous because they promoted a false Messiah who was dead in the grave. It, but he goes on to describe to Agrippa what happened to him. Just like Luke describes to us what happened in Acts chapter 9. And you got to imagine, at this point, according to, to Luke, 5,000, 6,000 people already are trusting in Jesus Christ. They believe this too. And the religious leaders and Paul, they're beside themselves. They wanted, we, what are we going to do? And so they decide, well, we're going to persecute. We're going to throw them in jail. And so much so that, that here we uh, find out that, well, in chapter 8, we, we read all about Stephen uh, being stoned to death as he proclaimed Christ. And, and it says a great persecution broke af out after that. Paul was all involved with that. And so then he goes to Damascus. We're going to track them down wherever they are, and we're going to put an end to this. And so that's what we find he's doing in, in verses 1 and 2 in Damascus. But on his way, he's accosted by Jesus Christ in verses 3 and 4. A light from heaven shone around him. He, Paul falls to the ground, this proud, controlling, self-righteous Pharisee manifesting his utter weakness. Uh, being, uh, you know... B He's overpowered by this theo theophonic presence. Uh, he immediately loses all control of the situation. The man who had all control and had the power to put people in jail. And he hears this unmistakable voice of the risen Christ. Saul, why are you persecuting me? In other words, Saul... You are wrong. You are, what you're doing is wrong. The reason you're driven to murder those I love are wrong. Why? Because I'm alive. I'm here in your presence. And you can't deny it. You, you know I'm alive. I want you 
to change. I want you to serve me. Verses 8 and 9, Saul is left blind, disabled, and has to be led into the city by those who are with him. Verses 10 to 19, three days later, the Lord sends Ananias to him who lays his hands on Paul Paul, and prays over him, uh, speaks to him about Christ, and he receives the Holy Spirit and can once again see, and he's restored to strength. And then verses 20 to 22, to everyone's great surprise, he begins to preach about Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So what do we make of this event? I mean, first, just from a historical standpoint, Luke the historian, I mean, if you take nothing else from this message, you should at least now have a greater awareness why so many churches are named after uh, after him, right? Say St. Paul's Cathedral, that's that big Episcopal church in London, or St. Paul's Basilica in, in Rome. Uh, there, there's over a hundred churches and schools just in North Carolina alone, named after St. Paul. Eleven of them are here in the triangle. And they're all named after this man. As I said, after he met Christ, he became the apostle to the Gentile, to the nations. And and though others took this message of Jesus far and wide, you should know that Paul was the pace setter. He, He spread this good news outside of Israel. He founded church after church, Galatia, Philippi, uh, uh, Colossae, and many others. And the reason, I guarantee you, the reason we're here today in some way or another traces back to this man. You should also consider that Paul wrote 30% of the New Testament. The letters that he wrote made up 30% of what we call the New Testament. And then if you take Take Luke into consideration. Luke, who traveled with Paul, who was his buddy. Luke, everything Luke writes was shaped by his experience with Paul, the gospel and, and uh, the book of Acts. And, and Luke writes another 28% of scripture. So, so really, 60% of scripture is influenced and comes via the thinking, the transformation, what happens in Paul's life, without a doubt, there is no other conversion, transformation in an individual's life that made as much difference to the world as this uh, man, Paul. And it's, it's all spawned from this one historical event in his life that made this man who he was. Of course, you know, Luke, he doesn't write just to talk about Paul. He, he's talking about what Jesus Christ did, the, the, the presence and work of this living Savior, what he did through this whole, this early church uh, unfolding, of which Paul was a significant participant in. And, and you know, this is probably where we should talk a little bit about Luke, uh, the, the theologian, you know, he, he wasn't just talking history, he was talking theology. What, what was Luke trying to get across theologically? Well, the, Luke didn't just tell us one story, one conversion story. He actually tells us three in a row. Uh, first, in chapter 8, there is a conversion uh, of a man who is an Ethiopian. And, and this man's reading, Isaiah 53. We talked about it uh, a number of months ago. Isaiah 53, written 700 years before, uh, before Jesus, before Paul. And it, it, Isaiah writes about this man who is a suffering servant who would redeem his people. And the Ethiopian wanted to know who this man was. And so Philip, uh, 
a disciple of Jesus met him and told him all about what who this man in Isaiah 53 was that was Jesus. And the Ethiopian believes this and returns to his home country with great joy. And then we go on to the second conversion uh, that we read about here. Paul. Paul was a man who knew all about Isaiah. He knew the rest of the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament. There was no one who surpassed Paul in his knowledge of the Hebrew Bible. And yet... His heart was as hard as could be towards God. And, and, and that kind of attitude was actually a major theme throughout the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 29 says, These people come near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In judgment of this, Isaiah says in the same chapter, he says, the Lord has sealed your eyes. Uh, chapter 42, he calls Isaiah deaf and blind. Chapter 6, he says that they will be ever hearing, but never understanding. And ever seeing, but never perceiving. And so Luke makes sure you don't miss this connection. Uh, he, you know, he, here he is. Uh, encountering the risen Christ. And here this group of men are hearing this, this voice, and, but they have no idea where it's coming from. Uh, in chapter 26, Paul says they didn't understand anything of that sound at all, though Paul, Saul himself, could hear it and understand. The rest of them had no idea. And then what happens to Saul? Well, he's blinded to, to, to drive home the fact that you're just like what Isaiah wrote about 700 years ago. You think you know, but your heart is far from me. And, 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 but, but then, of course, uh, conversely, as Jesus restored Paul's sight, what could Paul say but... Surely this is the servant of the Lord of whom Isaiah spoke about, who according to Isaiah 42 would restore the sight to the blind and set captives free. And when Ananias laid hands on Paul, telling him that Jesus sent him to do this, his sight was restored. What could Paul believe? What could he, the only thing he could think and believe is that, wow, this Jesus, who spoke to me, has got to be the servant of the Lord spoken about in Isaiah. Then, of course, we then get to a third conversion. We'll talk about this one next week of this man, Cornelius. Uh, and Cornelius was one of these Gentiles, a non-Jewish person. The first one who believes in Christ. And again, if you read the entire book of Isaiah, you know it's all about the fact that one day a light uh, would come to the Gentiles, that they would believe, they, those non-Jewish nations would know God, God would come to them. And so here we have the story right before of a light coming to Paul, br bringing him, restoring him so that he can go out and share this good news with the Gentiles. And so Luke, the theologian, goes from sharing how Isaiah 53 was fulfilled with the Ethiopian in chapter 8, then to the blind receiving sight with Paul in chapter 9, to this Gentile being reached in chapter 10 with Cornelius to drive home the unmistakable message that what Isaiah spoke about 700 years ago had now come to fruition. And that then leads us from Luke the historian and Luke the theologian to Luke the evangelist, to Luke the apologist. The, you know, the recorded history is appreciated. Wow, it's good to know how important Paul was. Uh, the theological connections, they may have be of interest. They may be arresting even. But 
But Luke records this event in Paul's life so that we would believe that Jesus is Lord, not just some kind man, not just some teacher who who, who now happens to be resting in, in a grave peacefully, but that he is a Lord of the universe, that that he's alive, that he's reigning in heaven and should rightfully be Lord of our lives as he was to the disciples and as he became to Saul that day, this persecutor. Uh, That's why, why, why Luke so meticulously points out repeatedly in his gospel, in the book of Acts, the connections between Isaiah and what was unfolding in this early church. He wanted you to know that the only way these prophecies could be fulfilled by this man and what happened afterwards was if it was true. But but Luke didn't want you just to, to, to think about the prophetic fulfillment of it. He wanted you to look at Paul himself, his his dear friend. How can you explain such a change in a man's life as this? Historically, there's no doubt that he was who we just described him as uh, before he became a Christian. He was a zealous believer in an entirely different way of understanding God. Uh, Paul, you you think about when, when, when Paul encountered Christ, he could not deny it. For three days, he was blind. He couldn't just say, oh, wow, that was weird. Uh, What was that? And, And just go on. There was physical proof that what he just experienced continued on. The guys who were around him heard something and they talked about it afterwards because, again, we're told, Paul says, they didn't understand. In other words, they talked about, hey, did you hear what just happened? I have no idea what that was. Paul did. There was physical proof of what happened to him. In every letter Paul writes, he draws attention to this change of heart and the call he received. Almost every letter starts out by him saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ called by Jesus, called by God. Every time he writes, he raises that up first to say, I'm a changed man because of what has happened to me. As you read what he writes, and I encourage you, if you've not read what Paul writes, read it. It's great. Every one of his letters, filled with joy, filled with hope, filled with purpose, filled with that thing that fills you when you feel like, hey, I don't understand what life's about. He was brilliant. He was focused. He was winsome. He was not a crazy man. And he suffered repeatedly for what he proclaimed about Christ. He writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked a night and a day. I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And he goes on to be executed in Rome because of what he believed, what he preached. Why was he so relentless through such hardship to make Christ known, to proclaim Christ as the risen Savior? 
because he knew he met Christ on that road that day, that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Christ was risen from the dead and is now Lord over all as Paul could no longer deny after what happened to him over those three days? Because if you do, your life is transformed. You become a different person and I guarantee you a better person. Filled with more joy, more hope, more direction. Look, we know Paul, we know Luke was Paul's friend. We know Luke was a historian. We know Luke uh, was a theologian. We know Luke was an evangelist. One thing you don't find out about Luke, one thing that Luke was not, at least by what he wrote, was a pastor. You find no counsel from anything Luke writes. He just tells stories. I'm sure those who knew Luke, uh, he, he surely was a person of great care and encouragement and, and comfort in, in their lives and had wonderful words to speak to them. And, but, but let me take the liberty to share with you what I think Luke would say to you as a pastor after what he wrote. Every single person has to have an experience like Paul had on that road. It doesn't have to be as dramatic as what Paul experienced, but it does have to be as authentic. Look, Paul Paul was a religious man, and he did not know God. Being religious doesn't make you a Christian. Paul followed the law and did all kinds of right things in his life, but he did not know God. Doing good things doesn't put you into a relationship with the living God. He went to the temple and synagogue repeatedly, but he did not know God. He was even jealous, I'm sorry, not jealous, he was zealous for God. He didn't know him. What made Paul a Christian? Meeting Jesus Christ. Trusting Christ made Paul a Christian. He writes to the Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am who I am. It is by the grace of God that we are confronted with him, that we meet him and are made right with him. It's not by anything we do. Paul would have never had a relationship with the living God unless he had an authentic encounter with Christ. Now now that may not happen like it happened with Paul. Uh, The the Ethiopian, he, he, he opens up scripture and reads it and he goes, wow, I know who Christ is now. Uh, The Cornelius, he, he hears a sermon uh, preached by Peter and, and he meets Christ. The spirit of God works in different ways in people's lives to bring us face to face with Christ. And and yeah, like Peter, you you may wrestle, Lord, who are you? What? I don't understand fully. Tell me more. And and like Paul, when we meet Christ, we come acutely aware of our own sin and how we've fallen short of who we should be as we stand before a holy God. And, And and yeah, we, just like Paul, we, we've got to fall to our knees in humility and lose control and say, Lord, I'm tired. I, I can't control my life anymore. It's yours. We have to approach God humbly to be reconciled to God through his death on the cross that he suffered to take away our sins. But as with Paul... There's good news. 
He hasn't come to destroy you. He hasn't come to wipe your life out or repay you for what you have done to others and to God himself. He's come to restore you, to heal you, to to raise you up and open your eyes and give you new life filled with his very presence, filled with joy, filled with purpose, filled with assurance, filled with satisfaction and meaning. You cannot know God unless you meet the risen Christ. Unless you kneel before him in your heart. Unless you allow him to work a great work in your life. And maybe, maybe just for some of you today is that day. Maybe in some way, Jesus is saying, here I am. I actually am alive. I I want to restore you. I want to give you a life that will be hard, but you will be on the greatest adventure you've ever been on. Well, I pray that might be so. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for Paul's example. We thank you for the work you did in his life, the way you transformed not only him, but the world through him. We ask Lord, that in some way, each one of us this day, Lord, would you confront us and knock us to our knees again, that we might acknowledge you as our Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Would you stand, if you were able, with us to sing Amazing Grace? And and we're going to sing this song Um, in response to the teachings that we heard. It is so familiar, um, and and I find with songs that are familiar that I kind of go on autopilot as I sing them, um, and the lyrics just kind of flow through me, but they don't really touch me. And I I want this song to touch us right now, as it is a response to the teaching that we just um, heard. How are we blind this morning um, to to our own sin, and and how much do we need Jesus? Um, Would you sing... Amazing Grace with us now.
just the voices. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be Let us pray together. Indeed, Lord, you give us amazing grace. We cannot earn it. We do not deserve it. You are the one who transforms our lives, Lord. You are powerful. You are the one who heals us. You call us by name. And you say, step into your light. So, Lord, meet us wherever we are. Meet us personally, just as you met Saul on that road. Meet us this day, Lord. Remind us, Lord, of your power, of your light that truly heals us. Lord, may we experience true joy in you and in the grace that you give us. You say to us, here I am. Help us to receive you and enjoy you, confessing our sins and experiencing that the gospel message of restoration is for us. So, Lord, we thank you for your church that gathers this day. Help us, Lord, to experience your joy. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of prayer. So, Lord, we offer our prayers to you. We lift up those that we know this this day that are close to our lives. Uh, Good morning, Triangle Grace Church. Uh, I'm Elder Eric Rodgman, and I'm connected with the children's ministry and Nancy Holton. Uh, I'm going to help pray a little bit, and I want you to consider these prayer concerns for today. The family of uh, Bailey Brooke and her parents, they were traveling or in Florida and have had to go into the hospital for some serious health issues. Please keep that entire family in prayer. I also ask you to consider keeping in prayer Molly Williamson and her parents as they have most recently contracted COVID, that they get over this quickly and return. Uh, I also want you to consider keeping in prayer all those kids, parents, volunteers, and folks who work with the youth ministry. Uh, The youth club team will be meeting for the first time this week to prepare for our ministry play for the fall so keep all those folks in prayer and especially i want to uh do a personal shout out to uh uh, my wife and i have been blessed my son kevin and his wife adela just had a baby girl on july the 15th so we are blessed with one more uh, grandchild and i want to add one special thing to this as well We know that uh, Mark and Nicolette Granada are leaving, but we were blessed because their son, Casey, and his wife, Whitney, also had a baby girl right across the hall from us at Duke University. What an incredible blessing, and I'm just over the moon thankful that everybody is safe. Um, Lastly, I just want to close with one quick verse of encouragement. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such 
closeness. You are near to us. Lord, when we have our valleys, you are with us. When we celebrate birth, when we celebrate life, you are with us. So we give you thanks, Lord, for this day. Indeed, Lord, you are Emmanuel. So we celebrate you. And we join together in the prayer saying that you taught your disciples long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship our Lord. If you are able, please stand where you are singing. Hymn number 382, hymn number 382, Be Thou My Vision. want to remind you after the service directly across uh, the hallway in our fellowship hall we are having macaroons today for a taste of durham macaroons from i think shayla's bakery or something like that so uh, make sure you go visit shayla if you like them tell her we uh, had a feast on sunday uh, but i also want to let you know that if there's a prayer upon your heart this day you know paul had ananias to come to him and say, Brother Paul, Brother Saul, uh, sometimes it's good to have someone else to pray with. You know, Ananias prayed with him. His life was changed because of that prayer. Uh, maybe there's something on your heart this day that you want prayer about. Eric and Jeff and others will be up in this section. They consider it a great privilege. Maybe you want to pray to receive Christ this day. If there's something on your heart that you want pray, prayer about, um, the Granadas, you better get up here because we're praying for you. Right? Uh, we we want to take the opportunity to pray with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. Uh, the Lord fill you with his peace and joy and love today and for every day. We pray amen. Could you guys make yourself available for prayer over there?